So, um, a little bit of snafu here, right? So uh, I like got a little surge of adrenaline because I thought it was me. And so, so if I'm manic and I like go too fast over something, please like, hey, could you slow down a little bit? Um, that's totally fine. So this talk is driving technical change. I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Terry Ryan. I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud, and I'm happy to talk about that. I won't talk about much in this talk, uh, except where like some real life experiences kind of come through. Now. Does this sound familiar, right? You go to an event, you go to a conference, and you get really excited about a new tool or technology, and you want to use it, uh, and so you spend time being thoughtful about where would this make sense within our organization, and yeah, like I could bring this back, and this would really work well, and this would be great. Um, and uh, you bring it back, and uh, people, <laughs> you don't just get no, you get hell no, right? Like, I don't want to adopt this thing. I don't want to do this. And now your nerd dreams are crushed. Uh, and you have to look everybody in the eye, and they all know they beat you on it, right? How many people have had this experience? How many people, this sounds familiar? Yes, right? Make this really clear. You are not alone. Um, you are not alone. Everybody in this room has experienced it. And when you experience this, one of the pieces of advice you will get is this. Change your organization or change your organization, which is really a pithy way of saying, like, quit or, like, fix it. Um, now, there are organizations that this is true for. Uh, there, sorry, there are scenarios in which this is true. Like, I, I make fun of this, uh, but, like, someone brought this up in the sense of, like, a very toxic organization, and that's fine. I'm not knocking that. But for this particular problem, I want to do new things, and people aren't coming along uh, with me. This is really bad advice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my background and explain why I think this is bad advice for this problem. So I, my first real job in tech was at a place called Wharton, uh, the Wharton School of Business. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with the Wharton School of Business, it is like inarguably the, one of the top 10 business schools in the world. It is arguably the number one business school in the world. Usually that's an argument you have from somebody who goes to Wharton. Um, and at the time, uh, this is like the mid-90s, they were competing with Harvard and with Stanford, and Harvard is Harvard, right? And Stanford is, well, Stanford is Stanford, too. It's like gorgeous and beautiful, and it has this pipeline directly into Silicon Valley. Um, and Wharton is in Philly. Uh, now, I'm from Philly, and I love Philly, but even me, like, that's a tough sell, right? <laughs> like, you could be at Harvard, you could be in this beautiful paradise, or Philadelphia, like, eat some cheesesteaks. Um, so, what Wharton decided to do was com to compete with technology, to make technology ubiquitous, to make every classroom have, uh, like, instead of having one enhanced classroom, every classroom was our enhanced classroom. Um, instead of, uh, so we had a portal before Yahoo existed. Uh, they had uh, Facebook before Facebook existed. They, they, they were on, they were doing cutting edge stuff with the technology. In fact, that whole, um, that whole uh, thing about like making technology ubiquitous in the classroom, they actually went to a vendor and worked with them to design the perfect podium that was raisable and lowerable, uh, had a cup holder, uh, had, a screen, had a screen in it that you could pull apart the, the top of the screen, and that vendor resells it as it's a Wharton podium. And this actually is the Wharton podium, and I was part of the team that designed it. Like randomly they sold it, and it's here, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so clearly, uh, we did we like we uh, won uh, awards, uh, industry awards. We had people coming back from Fortune 500 companies saying, "I never, I, I don't have computing as well as I did as when I was a student at Wharton. Mission accomplished." But I had that problem when I was there, getting people to adopt new things. You'd think they're using technology as a competitive advantage. They do it. No, um, I ran into this problem there. So I was like, okay. I know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go into industry. And I joined Adobe, which is a great place to work. Um, it's fantastic, but I still ran into this problem. All right, screw this. I'm working for Google, right? And whatever you wanna say about Google, it's a company that values technology and doing new things. And I have this problem at Google. 
Specifically, like, come on, people. Why are you storing in spreadsheets what is clearly relational data? All right? So <laughs> you are going to run into this problem wherever. So this advice, change your organization or change your organization, you can't, you cannot run away from this problem. You're going to have it every place you go. So, uh, and that's because it's not a technology problem, is is not even a culture problem, it is a people problem. So, along the way, I figured out some things. Uh, some attempts to drive technology were more successful than others. And I realized people resist in patterns. Um, I was very much into patterns and anti-patterns when I came up with this, and like, it's perfectly a design pattern language. I'll just come up with patterns and anti-patterns for this. So people resist in patterns, and therefore they're, they respond to certain things better. Um, and uh, so I came up with a process. The process goes something like this. You identify the type of skeptics, the anti-patterns. You identify what, how people are resisting. You match them to countering tactics. And then you, you implement tactics in a greater strategy. I will explain all this as I go through. But as you see, it's relatively straightforward. And that's the thing about this. It is simple. It is not easy, right? Like rolling a builder up a hill is simple, right? Like just apply force thusly. But it's not necessarily easy. So before I continue, I need to bring this up. The first question I always get if I don't put this part here is uh, how do I know what tech, like how do I know what I'm pushing is the right thing? That's a great question to ask. That is not part of the scope of this. Like this takes something minor or like, uh, should you use SQL or NoSQL? That is a whole talk within a whole track of talks, within a whole event, which is a, a, a whole fleet of events that talk about this problem. I'm going to assume you're all good people and you all are, are thinking things through and you're making the right decisions with your technology. Make sure it's the right thing for your organization and you're not just wanting to do the new shiny. It's cool. Um, but I'm going to assume you've all done that and this is, this is, you're, you're pushing the right things. So let's talk about the skeptics. You are going to see yourself in these skeptics. <laughs> these are characters, not that one, uh, but these are caricatures, right? They're, they are not meant to be, like, if you see yourself and you start getting like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find this guy when he's smoking afterwards and, and hit him with a chair. Like, no, like, it's not meant to be personal. It's not meant to be, uh, it is just a way of explaining this. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I will, I will cop to the skeptic type I am. And it's, it's, it's nasty. So I will, I will. I will, I will reveal personally that I am guilty of these things, too. So yes, uh, we, I understand these are characters and that real people are more complex, right? Um, so first type is the uninformed. It's pretty understandable, right? Like, these are people that don't know about your new tool or technology. That's why they're not using it. You can change them over pretty easily. Hey, have you heard about this thing, right? You, you, it's relatively easy to move these people off of uninformed. You have to be careful that when you move them off of uninformed, you don't move them to one of the other skeptic types, but as these go, these are relatively low-hanging fruit. The next are uh, the herd, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, my monitor down here is broken, so that's why I'm looking back. Uh, the herd, so there are, not you guys, right? Because you are at an event trying to learn more, but there's a lot of people who aren't really interested in leading. Uh, they, they come to work, they do their work, they work nine to five, they go home and they do other things. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not looking to push the envelope. They want to get their job done and go on and do the things that their job enables the rest of their life. That's totally cool. Most of the work done in the world is done by people who show up, do their job, and go home. But you're here at a conference. You're looking to expand yourself, so you're not these people. Um, so they aren't looking for the next thing. They aren't looking for what's new. They need somebody to guide them. They need somebody to say, hey, Come on in, this is what, where we should be going. So the good thing is that they, they will respond to leadership. The bad thing is that you need to lead them, and that's effort. So just keep that, keep that in mind. Next group are the cynics. So skepticism is good. Devil's advocacy is good. Having to defend your ideas and your tools and technology to people is good. However, sometimes this can, this can go to a pathological extent. There are people who just... They have a reason, no, for everything you want to do, right? Now, some of this is just skepticism and cynicism, and people have been working in the industry too long, and they, they uh, you know, it's just the same thing we're doing over and over again, which is not, you know, altogether unfair. 
But there's another source of this, uh, and this is, this is where I, I cop to being this. Certainly in my earlier days, um, I, I struggled very hard not to do this today. But there are, the reason, one of the reasons why cynics uh, appear is that in this industry that we are, we are driven by intellect, right? Like you want to look smart. Right, because looking smart reveals that you're smart, and that's what the capital is here. Um, there are two ways to look smart. One is to prep and prepare and really know what you're doing and really know your technology inside and out and uh, really, really understand what you're talking about. Or you find that guy, and when he's talking about his stuff, you ask him a question that makes him look dumb. Right? <laughs> that's a lot easier. <laughs> Uh, and this is where I cop. Like, this is, this is the type of jackass I was. Um, not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, uh, and there's like a coworker of mine in the, the room, so he can reveal whether or not that's true. Um, but so this is where that group, this is, this is some of the dynamics going on with this group. The next group are sort of like the cynic in that they're saying no to this new thing. And they have objections. But their objections are borne out by actually having tried the thing. They're not knee-jerk knowing. They are like, I tried this thing and it blew up in my face. Now, it could have been it was the wrong time, it was the wrong group of people that they tried it with, it uh, was the wrong type of a solution, maybe they tried a product from one vendor and another vendor would have been better in your org, whatever. Also, it could have been them, right? Like, <laughs> right? Like, like, that's a possibility. And even if it wasn't them, they're gonna identify with that failure and anything of like, no, it's actually good is going to be met with like existential dread, right? Because like that means I screwed up. No, no, you didn't screw up. So you got to be you got to be very careful with these people and dance around ego. But this is uh, this is a strong, strong argument to have to come up against. Next is the time crunch. Um, I love these guys. They schedule meetings with you to tell you how busy they are and how many meetings they're in and how they can't possibly do what you need to do. Um, I also like to say about these guys. Uh, there's never time to do it right. There's always time to do it wrong twice, right? <laughs> so these are people that are so busy, so pegged, uh, like their processor, they're, they're like my MacBook when I'm running StarCraft II on it, right? Like it's just, <laughs> right? So they can't take in any new thing. They can't, they can't the idea of stopping, learning something, uh, and, and then reapplying, even if it could get rid of all the rest of their outstanding work, it's just, it's terrifying, because it's just gonna, it's just gonna build up and build up, and they're not gonna, they're not gonna be able to get what they have already in queue done, let alone new things. So, um, these people are a challenge. You have to show that whatever you're doing actually can reduce their, their, uh, their thrashing, and you have to, like, time it for when they, like, have a brief break. Otherwise, they won't, they won't come over. So, I'll talk about strategies and tactics of how to deal with that. Next is the boss. Now, the boss isn't necessarily hostile to what you're doing, but a lot of times, and for this sake of argument here, boss isn't necessarily the person you report to. It's whoever's the authority over the project or technology area that you're looking at. So it could be a client, it could be executive oversight, it could be your team lead, it could be a project, like whatever. It's not, you know, don't stick with the boss itself. But a lot of times these people are not technical, and yet we try to bring them technical problems and solutions and get irritated when they don't buy them. And the trick here is that you have to make your technology, your, 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 the thing you're trying to do, a solution to their problems and not a solution to your problems. If we switch over to this new way of doing things, um, our code base would shrink by 20% and be fantastic and, and, well, no, like that is not their problem. If we switch over to this new code base, it'll be much easier to bring new developers on board, and therefore people will be productive much faster, and uh, we'll be able to drive down costs of hiring new developers. Drive down costs, love it, right? So make your, whatever you're trying to move, whether it's a language, a product, a technology, a system, a solution to their problems, and not, not talk about it in terms of yours. Now this last group is the irrational. Uh, these guys are awful. Uh, the reason why is because whatever, everyone else like, has a legitimate beef, right? Even the cynic is, is maybe just an overactive uh, devil's advocate. But the irrational, 
The problem is their, their, their argument, the problem they have with your new tool or technology has nothing to do with the tool or technology. It could be that you cause a server outage like your first day at work and they've been pissed at you ever since, so nothing good comes from you. It could be, you know, uh, you're a woman and they, they have a problem with that, right? Like, that, that is a thing. Uh, it could be that they see being the expert in this thing as job security and now you're wanting to change it and they, that's an existential threat. So they have to oppose it uh, so that they can, they can keep their job security, or at least in their, in their own minds. Thing is, it doesn't really matter what their reason is, and like I could go into many, many more reasons, because for the most part, with the exception of the sexism one, you really can't say that stuff publicly and like get away with it. Uh, I'm sad about the sexism that you can, but uh, you can't say, that guy ticked me off my first day, so all his ideas are garbage, right? Like that, <laughs> that won't fly. So what they do is they hide as another type. And that's really the only interaction you need to have with these people is figuring out if they're irrational and then ignoring them afterwards. The way you figure out they're irrational is because they know they can't say the thing they really do, so they come up with rational reasons. Now I'm going to tell you a story, and it's going to sound absurd, right? But just bear with me. This is a real dude somewhere. So <laughs> we, we had, uh, I was a systems guy at Wharton for a while, and we had SQL servers, Microsoft SQL servers. And uh, <clears throat> one of the guys in the team, who was a, like basically a client of ours, was sort of the relationship, um, told me, he, yeah, he wasn't going to use indices. He didn't believe in indices. <laughs> right? Like, I say dumb saying that out loud. This is the guy's real opinion. Uh, well, no, it wasn't, but this is what he really said. And his response was, well, you guys spec out the hardware so well that I don't feel any need to like, worry about, because like, I don't want to mess up the right performance by adding indices. Like, that's crazy. All right, dude. Like, so that was, his, that was his argument. And then later down the road, we, were, um, we had a stored procedure rule because the database, the DBAs were better at DBAing than the developers at the time. So all the stuff had to go through stored procedures. It was fixing a problem that we had. Whether or not it was a good rule or not, it worked for us, and it was a good thing. Um, but we were looking to figure out ways of easing it. One of the things we said was, well, if you go with an ORM, if you go with uh, Hibernate, um, that's usually pretty good SQL, and we can manage that. And so if you do ORM, you don't have to use stored procedures. The guy comes back and says, no, 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 no. If we go off of stored procedures, we're going to, like, I." I'm really worried about hardware performance under those cases, right? Like, so indices bad for hardware performance, but uh, stored procedures only is the only thing that will save our hardware performance. So it's clear this guy's not, um, not dealing with this rationally. Uh, and it turned out what it was was that this guy was a manager, and uh, he came up with another developer. So it was to, to, they were developers together, and management decided we couldn't promote just one of these guys because the other one will get resentful. So they promoted both of them to be co-directors, but then left them with development responsibilities. And the cognitive load of being in that scenario of like competing with another manager, but also having to develop, and like it was just too much, and this guy just never wanted anything to change. He was time crunched to the, to the extreme, so it became like crazy, right? But that's, that's what kind of happens with the irrational. You'll ignore them, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But uh, So they are the last type. So we now have the types identified. Let's talk about tactics. Oh, I had this thing. Why am I going all over the way? Um, no, now I'm going backwards. All right. There are two kinds of tactics. Uh, there are tactics that you can do all the time. They're universal. You, there's nothing. One of them is like become an expert. I'm not, I'm not like spoiling anything. Right? Um, you can, or I could just use the verb spoil, which is the right way of saying that. Um, they're universal. They can be used all the time. Uh, like becoming an expert, you can just do that, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. It is <clears throat> moderately impactful, meaning that in all cases, it will not necessarily yield you results. You have to combine it with other tactics and techniques. There are also circumstantial, what do I call them? Uh, situational. They're only, you have to have the right environment for them. Like a government regulation says you need to make this massive change. You tie your change to that situation, and it gets, uh, you know, you're solving the big business problem with this technical problem. Uh, they have very high impact, and so when you luck into them, they're awesome. 
uh, but you have to make sure, like, they have to be present. So let's talk about uh, the universal one. So first one is expertise. So the first thing I'll say is you should know more about the tool or technology they're pushing than the people you're trying to push it to. Um, you should be developing expertise. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a bona fide expert, like industry rated. What it just means is you have to, because like, quite frankly, ex being an expert is not a static thing. You don't become an expert, then you're an expert and you're done, right? Because version two of that product comes out, or this plugin becomes a big part of the ecosystem. And like, so expertise is always fading. So you always need to be moving to it, not necessarily having reached it. So be pushing to know more than the people that you're, you're trying to bring on board uh, know about the technology so that you can um, be the helpful hand they need to learn about the technology when they're struggling in the beginning. Next one is delivery. And this goes without saying, like, don't be a jerk about this stuff, but I work in technology, so I know it does not go without saying, don't be a jerk about this, <laughs> right? Um, and we all, I think we're all guilty of this, like, you, you know, someone does something, and your first response is, why the hell would you do that? And that is natural, but it is not friend-making, right? So, um, interesting. Tell me about the thought process that led you to do that. It's funny, I said the same exact thing, and yet I've alienated less people with that, unless they read through the lines. So, like, you know, have you tried this versus you should do this, right? Like, Soften your language, make sure if you need to practice with somebody to make sure that you're not being too aggressive. I am uh, from, as I said, from Philadelphia, and we are not, there are many things we're known for, but politeness is not one of them. <laughs> so now working in the Bay Area, I need to like check myself, like am I, am I, am I being too blunt, too honest? There's something you may have to do, it's fine. Um, people will help you do it. Uh, so make sure you're checking your delivery. Uh, next is demonstrate. I, I demonstrate the cloud for a living. That's my job, to go in and show this stuff working. And I can tell you how awesome our stuff is. I can tell you all these stats and numbers um, and tell you why you should give this a try. But until I show a screen and I show, look, watch this, boom. And I set a whole bunch of load at something and it spins up all these things. People, whoa, wow, that's, that's, I get it. I get what you're saying now. People need to see the stuff. Um, there's a thing in, there's a saying in uh, script writing, show, don't tell. Right? Show, don't tell. Show these things working. If you have to build demo, demo apps, if you have to take a small problem you have and show that your, your, your solution works for it, do that. Um, if you can demonstrate it, do it. The last universal one is trust. You have a long relationship with your coworkers. You, they need to trust you. You need to not lie. And I know that sounds obvious, right? But don't say your thing does something it doesn't do because they'll, they will catch it and they will call you on it. Uh, and again, as someone who demonstrates stuff for a living, they will, um, even when you're just wrong and not lying. Um, so make sure you maintain trust. Make sure that um, it's okay to not lead with the negatives. Uh, like every solution, everything has downsides, right? It's okay to not lead with them, but make sure you have them so when someone asks them, you can, you can give it. The other thing is don't use FUD, and this comes up a lot. It's soft lying, right? It's soft like, I'm just gonna make you afraid. Uh, do you guys know what FUD is, fear, uncertainty, and doubt? Um, so it's an acronym that IBM, I think, either coined or it was named for IBM. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> what they would do is you'd go out and you'd have dinner with your, your IBM rep. This is like the 60s and 70s, so think very mad men but nerdier. And uh, you'd be having dinner, and they'd be like, hey, you know, I think I'm going with you guys, but I really got to check, and I don't know. And the IBM reps would like, they're smoking cigarettes, because he's getting 60. They'd, they'd get up, and they'd, well, that's great. We're, we just want to leave you with one thing, and that's this. No one ever got fired for choosing IBM. And then, poof, puff of smoke, and they're gone, right? Because they're just, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and they would make you afraid for you, you know, like, okay, like, I really need to go with them. Don't do that kind of stuff. Um, you, it sometimes happens in the workplace, so, so don't do it. A uh, little random aside, uh, my father worked for IBM, and uh, I have a book on this stuff, and he read the book, and he, he calls me up, and he's like, hey, I got to the chapter about FUD. 
And I'm like, yeah? And he's like, how do you know all that? And I was like, dad, like, there's an internet. Like, there's this thing that, like, all this stuff is out there. And I'm like, so did you guys really do that? And he's like, yeah. Yeah, we did. And he was, like, oddly wistful for these days where he did that. So I, he wasn't in sales, but I think he hung out with them too much. So a little oversharing there. Um, compromise. Uh, so I talked about stored procedures and, uh, and ORM. That was a great example of compromise. People hated moving to frameworks and frameworks that included ORM, but they hated stored procedures more. Compromise. I would really like you to move to frameworks because that would make all our coding better and more consistent. You hate stored procedures, we will compromise and we'll go to something we both hate less. Um, and that's a really great example. It's something you can do to like just bridge the gap. Again, you have to have that sort of environment where you've got the thing to do. Next is Synergy. Uh, I mentioned this briefly, like if you have a governmental concern like uh, Sarbanes-Oxley or an impending tech disaster like Y2K or any one of a number of random things that could happen that is, becomes a giant business concern that's not necessarily a technical concern, but your execs and your management really need this solved. So what you do is you tie your technical solution to it. Oh, uh, we need to log everything we do ever for compliance for this thing? Well, uh, I've been wanting to do aspect-oriented programming in a while, and we, if we made that switch over, it would be really easy to just add that, and it would drive down the cost of adding it. Boom, done. So tie your technical problem to a, another, uh, a larger problem, business problem. Next is pressure. So has anybody here ever worked with lawyers from a technology perspective, like supporting lawyers? Do they still use WordPerfect? Yes. Why do all lawyers use WordPerfect? Because all other lawyers use WordPerfect. It is the ultimate in peer pressure, or if you go to business school, it's called network externalities, but it's peer pressure. Um, so create a solution that everybody like, starts using. Like Slack is a really good example of this in a lot of organizations. Why does everybody use Slack? Because that's where the answers are. That's where everyone else is, um, among other reasons to use it. So create a solution that uh, other people start using and get, like, that's, that is where you find the answer. Like, um, <clears throat> I, oh, can I find your code for this thing? Oh, well, it's, yeah, it's, it's here, it's on GitHub, right? Like, there's another one of those things that became that way. Of, like, like, everyone else is using it, so you sort of get pressured into using it if you want to be uh, collaborative and successful. Last one is bridging. Uh, so I mentioned uh, I'll go with the stored procedure and hibernate thing because it was working for me. Um, so I was trying to push frameworks, and uh, we, this was before we started doing Hibernate. Uh, people would not come over to frameworks because most of the frameworks didn't support stored procedures, which we had to do for the other thing. So I wrote an ORM that was based on stored procedures. It would analyze the database, re write stored procedures, and then reread them to write code to, to generate. So scaffolding off of stored procedures. Don't ever, by the way, don't ever go down this rabbit hole. It's not, it's not a fun trip. Um, not that you really need to do that anymore these days. Uh, but what I did is I wanted them to use frameworks. I, made, I built a bridge. I built my own bridge. It wasn't the final destination, but it got people on so that uh, when Hibernate came by and they didn't have to use my crappy thing, they were, they were really happy about it. Um, so bridge. I think that is the last one. Oh, last one is publicity. publicity. This used to be a lot harder. Nowadays, uh, as long as your company allows it, you can put stuff on open source, you can get attention for it, you can get people using it around the world and then come back and say, hey, look, all these people are using it. Are we using it internally? No, that's odd. Um, so you can get publicity for stuff. Um, you, can, uh, you can try to put stuff up for industry awards. The other thing you can do is, um, and this is a dirty trick, uh, but I've done this and it really works well, is uh, <clears throat> every summer Wharton would, um, would redo their whole student system, and it was one year it was a feature branch, one year it was technical debt, because they only had two months. So they wouldn't do it at the same year, they'd pay off technical debt every other year and they'd do features, because the students rotated every two years. So one year, they, the team that did re-architected the student portal system used a whole bunch of my stuff, and they paid off the technical debt like within the first two weeks of their two month window, and so they added features in the rest of the time, which was awesome. So what I did is I went to the CIO and was like, did you hear the awesome thing the Spike team did? They did, they did like in two months, they, not only did they re-architect the whole back-end system, but they added a whole bunch of features. We've never done that before. It's great. So of course the CIO investigated. 
what did they find? That they used my thing, right? I didn't sell me, I sold them and let them sell me, right? So we cross-promoted and sucked a lot of the oxygen out of the room for the people that opposed what we were trying to do. A little dirty, but you know, all's fair. Um, <laughs> so, strategy. So we have these tactics and we have these patterns. What do we, how do we match them up? So the first thing is ignore the irrational, right? Other than to figure out they're irrational, once you figure out they're irrational, you're done with them. You're done. Leave them alone. You're never going to, because any time you spend arguing with them is wasted time. They'll just hop to another type. So ignore them. Next, target the willing. Start with the people that are the easiest to convert and convert as many of those people over in, in, you know, in increasingly difficulty. Uh, first group, uninformed and hurt, obviously. They're pretty easy to bring across. Cynic and burned are the, the next easiest. Time crunch are tough. So start hack, tackling them towards the end. Um, and then finally, the boss. Um, here, this presentation is online, so if you're like, you really like this, don't just get it off the line. You don't have to take a picture. Uh, but this is, the, this is which tactics line up best with which types. Um, you'll notice that Irrational have two. Uh, not, there's not really, like, just basically, you're not giving them a lot of windows in order to, to argue with you. Like, you're not being untrustworthy and you're not delivering like a jackass. Um, that helps them not have too many things to glom onto to resist you. Um, Next, harness converted. Tell people, I am trying to get more people doing this. There's a hand. I'm curious, why is the boss last? Oh, I'm going to get to that in a second. Great question. Um, so it's OK. Bring the people over um, uh, and then tell them, hey, I've got this campaign. And hey, you know what? Maybe uh, Bob won't listen to you because you caused that server outage on your first day. But he'll listen to Todd, and Todd will listen to you. right? So you convert Todd, and then Todd helps bring in Bob. Um, so Take the people that you've gotten and try to make this argument that um, you uh, that you um, you have this thing that's working. So, hopefully, this is all you need to do, right? You convert everybody this way, um, but that seldom it happens. It definitely has happened, but it seldom is in every case. So, the next, the last step is you sometimes have to go with the nuclear step of convincing management and getting a mandate. And the reason why I put bosses last, and the reason why I put convincing management as last, is because you want to do this organically. You want to do this without mandates. You want to do this with everybody agreeing to it. But sometimes you can't. And if you go to, a, if you go to, the manage, if you go to your boss or management or whatever, whatever this figure is, and say, I want to do this thing, the first question will be, well, why isn't everyone else doing it? Why is everybody else on board already? And you have to be able to say, well, actually, I converted a large number of people over, and um, I'm just waiting on a couple people. Uh, so make sure you have a momentum before you go to management to get a mandate and look at it as is an, un it is a, an unliked final step if you need it. Okay, so now a couple quick conclusions and I will pass over things to the Ignite sessions. Um, so change takes time. Uh, when I left Wharton, I felt like, God, like no one wants to, no one wants to do these things that are better. Uh, it was, at that point, it was, uh, continuous integration and frameworks and code reviews. I, I had stress, friction with all of these. Two years later, I come back for lunch, and they're like, oh, we just got a really tough meeting. Uh, yeah, so like, we have so many frameworks that we're using now that uh, we need to just whittle it down to like one or two. Um, so like two years later, now, now granted, there's other people there that were pushing it, but I feel like I, I loosened that pickle jar for them. Um, but it took two years, two years later. And so it's hard to see when you're on the ground, but change takes time, but it does happen. Um, the next is that it does take politics, and uh, specifically office politics, which people hate, right? Because like nobody, almost, you ever, ever hear someone who's like, I love office politics, I can't wait. Um, <laughs> no, no, you say like, oh, no, you know what, no, my, my job's great, I don't have any politics to deal with. Or, yeah, you know, other people do that, but I'm, I'm I don't care. I'm not in politics. And that person is, is lying to themselves or to, to you. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that if you have more than one person in an office, you have office politics. And here's the thing. If you really want to not have or have to deal with office politics, the way to do it is this. When you start out, you say, oh, politics doesn't exist. And so you get burned. So you say, OK, I'm tired of getting burned. What do I have to do? Well, like this is, you know, this guy was pissed off. And this group over there, like, they, they were late to the, and they, they had already switched to something else, and they weren't. So what you do is you're like, okay, this guy got ticked. So instead of just 
trying to do it in one step. I'll have a series of conversations with them beforehand before I, before I start bringing in everyone else. And then this team always does what this team does, so I'll start with them first, and I'll convert them over, and then that, that brings them over. And so like you have a victory, and you're like, okay, this is great. So then the next time, you're like, okay, I know what to do, and you start doing it. And then by the time you go through four or five cycles of this, you get to the point where you're not thinking about it. You're just doing it, right? Like, you know, like, all right, I got to do that, and I got to do that. Like, and so you've gotten office politics to disappear, but only through mastery. And it sucks, right? Because you got to put effort in the beginning. But the only way to really, if you want office politics to disappear for you, master it so that it becomes something you don't think about. It's just something you do. And the last point is, you know, uh, back when I first started giving this talk, like, you know, a long time ago, longer than I'd like to admit, um, I, 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 there's, there's this dream environment where, like, you would submit uh, a, you know, a, a to version control. It would get pulled down for code review. Someone would click it, right? It would get pushed to uh, testing server, or, you know, integration test servers, and then it get pushed over to staging and production. Like one click all the way to production, and that always seemed like a pipe dream. And then I start working in like the actual technology industry and like realize like no, that there are there are organizations that do that. Um, but but. Even, even when you have no shot at that, like even if you're a small organization, that, like, that takes resources that you don't have. Um, but that's becoming like, less and less of a deal. We see perfect as the enemy of good, right? But the fact of the matter is, is if you move to where you want to be, move towards it, you will be in a lot better place than you were before you started. So don't, don't say, because they can't get there, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll never get there from here, that you won't try them to make the move, right, to make the push. Because between where you are and where you want to be, there are a lot of better places. And here's the dirty secret. When you get to the perfect place, guess what? Version two is out. And so it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be pristine. Everything is, is depending on the word, is changing or rotting, depending on your outlook on life. But it's always going to be different. So focus on getting to that better place between where you are now and where you want to be. With that, I'll say thank you very much. If you want to heckle me, uh, there I am on Twitter, T. Pryan. Feel free to uh, throw comments and questions at me. Uh, I have a book. Uh, just, that's, like, that's really the bare minimum I need to do for my publisher. Um, and uh, thank you guys very much. I'll stick around for questions, but thank you.